My name's Julia. I work at Netflix. Um, I work on our personalization team, building out a lot of the large-scale data processing that powers Netflix personalization, and more generally, our recommendations. Let me start by telling you what this talk will be about. It's the story of how we built event time partitioning in Flink with this new table format called Iceberg. In particular, this talk is about what you do when you're done processing your data, how you write your data out of Flink and into a table for people to actually start using. I'll introduce Netflix playback data. This is gonna be our case study for today. I'll talk about what is event time partitioning, why it matters, and why you might actually care. I'll introduce this new table format called Iceberg, talk through our implementation details, and finally discuss some trade-offs with the streaming approach to event time partitioning. All right, so in case you aren't familiar with Netflix, we're an internet television service. Users can come to our service, either on our website or on one of the many devices we support, and they can stream television and movies. Every time a user interacts with video on our service, whether it's a trailer or a full-length feature film, this is known as a playback and it lands in our core playback data set. As I mentioned, this will be our case study for today. This is a super critical data set used pretty much everywhere at Netflix. It's used in our content buying decisions, it's used in our personalization algorithms, it's used in metrics for literally every A-B test. As such a critical data set, you can imagine it has a requirement both for really high accuracy and also lower and lower latency. Let's take a step back from playback data, though, for a second, and talk at a very high level about how we like to store and physically partition large-scale event data. So it all starts with an event. As I think a lot of people in this room are familiar, events have two different time characteristics. They have event time, the time when the event actually occurred, and processing time, the time when we actually received and processed the event. Events can frequently be processed out of order or significantly delayed either because clients are caching on their device or because there's some sort of upstream processing delay. And so for this reason, processing time and event time are often very different. So now, we want to store events in a table. Again, we're talking about large-scale event data. We're probably talking about something like HDFS, S3, or some other distributed file system. We're going to be partitioning by some sort of time characteristic. And now we have two different options. We can partition on processing time, or we can partition on event time. What does it look like if we try to partition by processing time? Well, let's say you want to ask a very simple question. How many times did a given event happen on a given date? If you've partitioned by processing time, you have to open potentially all or at least many different processing time partitions in order to get your answer. Because so many of our read patterns are based on event time, when we partition our large-scale event data by processing time, it frequently doesn't scale, or you have to trade off against inaccuracy. And so this really isn't ideal. But if instead we partition by event time, now the story is much easier. You want to know how many times did a given event happen on a given date or hour, you're simply going to open the partition for that date and hour, and you can go from there. And so partitioning by event time supports many of our common read patterns, and for this reason, it's an incredibly common requirement across pretty much all of our large-scale data sets, and I would expect many of your large-scale data sets as well. However, it doesn't come for free. While partitioning by event time makes for really nice read patterns, it comes at a cost on the right side. It doesn't matter whether you're processing your data in streaming or batch. If you have a bunch of events and you need to add them to a table, it's always going to be much harder to modify many different partitions in your table than to simply touch and modify the latest partition in your table. And so to sum all of this up, we like to partition by event time to support really nice read patterns, but this comes at a cost with complexity on the right side. Okay, so let's bring it back to playback data now and talk about how we process playback data end to end and ultimately land it in a nice event time partition table. It all starts with raw events on the clients. These are things like starts, pauses, heartbeats, resumes, et cetera, that come to us while you're streaming video. These raw events get written to Kafka, where they are then consumed by a custom Java application that applies some business logic. It's doing sessionization and summarization to write out playback session summaries back to Kafka. 
And these summaries are basically everything that happened during your playback. How long did you play? What title did you play? What device were you on? What country were you in, et cetera. These playback session summaries are then routed to a table partitioned on processing time. You can think of this as roughly a raw log of our Kafka output, where it then sits at rest and waits for a regularly scheduled batch job to read in the latest, partition, uh, latest process events, remove any duplicates from our streaming output, and then distribute them into the final correct event time partitions in our event timetable. This repartitioning step is actually really critical, especially for this playback data set, because we have one of the worst cases of late events at Netflix. And this is because we allow clients to do a lot of caching of their playback events while you're playing. We actually even let you play while you're offline. In addition, all of this sessionization and summarization introduces significant processing delays before we actually are ready to write the events. And so this repartitioning step is really very critical. So there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in this picture, but what I want to focus on is the fact that we're relying on this batch job to do our write into our event time partition table. And unfortunately, this isn't at all uncommon. As I mentioned, many of our large-scale event data has this requirement for event time partitioning. And so as we move more and more of this to streaming, we're getting this pattern where we're processing our data with some really nice streaming logic. These days it's usually in Flink, but then we're still relying on a batch job to do our write step to put the events into our final event time partition table. And this batch job is really a problem for two reasons. The first reason is pretty obvious, latency. It's a really big hit to take for an otherwise streaming pipeline to just sit around waiting for a batch job to redistribute your events into a table. But in addition, this batch job is actually surprisingly annoying from an operational perspective because we've introduced a tight coupling between a stream processing application and a batch application that breaks down very quickly in even the smallest of failure scenarios. And so we'd really like to do better. And we recently asked ourselves, what would it look like if we tried to build this in a streaming fashion? And we modeled this as trying to build what we're calling a router, which is really just a Flink application that can consume a stream of events and write to a table partitioned by event time. We wanted to build this first for playback data so that we can reduce latency and operational burden on one of our most critical data sets. Then we also wanted to build it generically just so we have a solution for writing data into event time partition tables in a streaming fashion. So let's take a moment to talk about why this is hard. The first reason this is hard really has nothing to do with event time partitioning. It's just that writing data in an exactly once fashion, as we all know, is a challenging problem. So before, when we were relying on that batch job, it could remove any duplicates coming out of our output stream. But now we need to remove any duplicates that are created during our application or that come into our application. And then we need to ensure that we're writing in an exactly once fashion without introducing duplicates or trading off with data loss during our failure scenarios. So this is the first reason this is hard. The second reason this is hard is if we're trying to do this with event time partitioning, we need to handle out of order and potentially significantly delayed events. And so if you imagine a stream of events coming through, most of them are gonna be recent events that are gonna go into some recent partitions, but we'll also have this long tail of late events. It needs to go into many different late partitions. And so we need to do this in such a way that we can do partition level modifications as we write out our data. And we need to be able to efficiently modify potentially many different partitions every time we write. And so for these two reasons, this is a challenging problem. But there's this new table format uh, being developed at Netflix called Iceberg that actually solves a lot of these problems for us. So uh, as I mentioned, this is being developed at Netflix, but it's also now an incubating Apache project. And it has a lot of really great features, but what I wanna focus on today is its support for atomic commits and file level changes. And as a result of those two features, when we hook it together with Flink, we get exactly once semantics doing partition appends. The atomic commits allow us to hook into Flink's checkpointing mechanism to give us the exactly once behavior that we need, and the file level changes allow us to do these partition level appends. And our platform recently introduced an iceberg sync in our internal Flink distribution. Let me do my best to describe how it works, at least at a very high level. And so if you imagine the stream of events coming through, on each of your Flink operators, we're gonna buffer those events into correctly partitioned files. But we're only going to commit those files within Flink's checkpointing. 
And when we do commit, we'll commit into the correct partitions. And so as a result of all of this, we're getting these partition level appends. And if there's any kind of failure case, we're still writing out in an exactly once fashion because we've hooked into Flink's checkpointing logic. OK, so now let's go back to our problem. Recall that we're trying to build this Flink application that can consume a stream of events and write the events into the correct event time partitions in our final table. Well, I'm a software engineer. I'm really good at Flink. I'll write dot sync iceberg. So what would happen if I simply consumed the stream of events and handed them off to an iceberg sync? This actually gets us a lot of the way there. This allows us to write our stream into the correct event time partitions in an exactly once fashion. But there was one very big hurdle that was stopping us from succeeding that we had to solve. So when we tried to plug this into playback data, we got an explosion of files. And when I say explosion of files, I really mean it. 250 million files per day. That's a lot of files. And so the reason this is happening is actually something I just explained a moment ago, is if you have the stream of events coming through, most of them will go to these more recent partitions. We're also going to have this long tail of events that are going to go to these late partitions. And so with this naive implementation, we're committing with the full parallelism of our app with every checkpoint to every single partition. And so that's simply not going to scale. Even if we could get this data to write, nobody's going to be able to read it because they'll have to open so many files for even the simplest of queries. And in addition, the files coming out of our application were significantly skewed for the same reason. So this was the first thing, the big, the big problem that we needed to solve. There was another problem, and I mentioned this as kind of a footnote because we expected it and it's pretty easy, which is that although we are doing our write in an exactly once fashion, we know that our incoming stream is actually at least once. And so we need to support some sort of deduplication to make sure we remove the duplicates before writing into our final table. So these are the two hurdles that we have left to solve. All right, so let's talk about how we solve them. We're starting with our source, and we need to get to our iceberg sync. We need to add a dedupe, and we need to do some work to manage the number of files. First, we'll get the dedupe out of the way. It works pretty simply. It's going to maintain a state of keys that we've seen so far. When an event comes through, if its key is in the state, we'll simply drop the event. And we'll evict keys from the state at the appropriate cadence. Now let's turn to the harder problem of managing the number of files. This really comes in two parts. The first part is introducing some batching in our application. So we're simply going to take the really late events and hold them in state and flush them at a periodic cadence. This ensures that we're writing to these older partitions much less often, and we're doing it without introducing any latency in the more on-time events that we want to pass on to our next operator immediately. The second half of this, and this is probably the neatest part of all of this, is introducing something that we're calling a dynamic partitioner. And it works by maintaining a state about the traffic volume that it's seen so far for any given partition. And it uses that state to dynamically react to traffic patterns to choose the appropriate write parallelism for a given partition. And so in particular, it knows if a partition has recently seen high traffic volume and it will give it high write parallelism, or if a partition has recently seen small traffic volume and give it small write parallelism. And so if you put these two things together, we're writing to our older partitions much less often, and the files coming out of our application are now going to be more evenly distributed. And so this was sufficient for getting us to a reasonable number of files. But because we have this great support for atomic commits, we can also turn on offline compaction in the background to merge any remaining skew coming out of our application and give us even better read performance. And so when you put this all together, we have our events coming through, we apply our dedupe, we do this batching and dynamic partitioning to manage the number of files, we hand it off to our iceberg sync that's now going to give us exactly once writes into the correct event time partitions, and we're done. Let's take a moment to talk about how we implemented some of these things under the hood. So the dedupe, uh, the dedupe is the first part. It's pretty simple. It's a keyed process function plus the timer service to evict keys at the appropriate cadence. The batching is also similar. It's also a keyed process function plus the timer service. In this case, we're using the timer service to evict these, key, uh, evict these late events from state with some really custom logic. And last, our dynamic partitioner, it works by pulling a site output from our stream as it goes by 
where this site output contains metrics about the traffic volume from each individual operator. It pulls them together in one big window, computes metrics about the global traffic volume we've seen across our application, and then distributes them out to all of the operators to use in making decisions about the parallelism for any given partition. All right, now coming back to our actual business problem, we've implemented this router. We can now plug it into playback data to write these playback session summaries directly into our final event time partition table in a streaming fashion. And in particular, that number I gave you before, which was around 250 million, it's now down to only around 100,000, and that's before any offline compaction. And so this was working pretty nicely. We're really excited to now be landing our core playback data set end-to-end -end in a streaming fashion. And it's already opened up a lot of business opportunities. We also think there's a lot more to come. But what I've implemented here has really nothing to do with playback data specifically. It's really generic event time partitioning out of the box through configurable Flink components. Depending on the nature of your stream, you might want these components to react differently. So for example, I think in many cases, the late batching is just not gonna be necessary because maybe you don't have that many late events. But by building this for what we consider to be one of our hardest cases, we're optimistic that this should work out of the box for any of our other large scale event data. That being said though, this is really just our very first version and I'm pretty excited to see this evolve as we potentially add more features. For example, I could see us doing something like adding some sort of bucketing so that we support predicate pushdown on our reads. In general, I'm excited to watch us get better and better at writing data out of Flink into tables in a way that supports really nice read patterns. But for now, we have this ability to consume a stream of events and write into our event time partition tables, which means that as we move more and more of our large scale event data to a streaming fashion, we no longer need to rely on that batch job. We can do it all in a streaming fashion now. But with all good things, this comes with some trade-offs. So let me take just a minute to talk through these trade-offs. So on the positive side, we're getting a latency win. We're doing this all in a streaming fashion. We no longer have to manage that pesky batch job that actually turns out to give us a lot of trouble. On the negative side though, the biggest challenge here is definitely gonna be failure recovery. Failure recovery with this pattern is much harder, excuse me, than with the batch pattern. This is primarily because we've added multiple, potentially long-lived states into our application. And also because we're now writing directly to our final table, so we don't have the luxury of cleaning up any mess offline that comes out of our streaming application. In addition, as you saw in that picture, that router definitely comes with some complexity. And so even if it, it's abstracted away in these nice Flink components, that's definitely a downside. It needs to be maintained and reasoned about as you read and write your data. All this being said though, these are trade-offs that we're really happy to make in a lot of cases to land some of our core data sets in a streaming fashion, still in this really nice event time partition pattern. In particular, we've been running on playback data for a little over a quarter now, and it's been going really smoothly. Before wrapping up, I want to acknowledge that this was really a team effort across a bunch of different teams at Netflix, from data engineering to our awesome platform team. And also acknowledge my collaborator, Lokesh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today for building a lot of the really cool stuff that I talked about. And I'll leave you with this, which is that next time anybody at Netflix wants to do event time partitioning in a streaming fashion, we're hopeful that it really will just be a dot sync iceberg. Thanks very much. Some Q&A. Sure. Hi there. Um, we have to do this with many of our data sets. <laughs> Uh, do you plan to open source your solution, that please? Is a, <laughs> that's a great question. I don't know the answer yet, I can get back to you. Yeah, because it requires both open sourcing the iceberg sync as well as open sourcing these components. And so we need to get a timeline on the first one in particular. Thanks, though. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>